Hello, my name is Christopher Lee, and these are my fireside tales. Feeling lucky? I've just the thing for you. This is the monkey's paw by W. W. Jacobs. In the small parlour of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. There he is," said Herbert White as the gate banged. The old man rose with hospitable haste and opened the door. Was heard condoling with the new arrival, a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris," he said, introducing him. The sergeant major shook hands and, taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whisky and tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass, his eye got brighter and he began to talk. The little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts as he squared his broad shoulders. And spoke of strange scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it," said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips. And then set it down again. His host filled it for him. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps," said the sergeant major offhandedly. "To look at, it's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy." He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what is special about it? Mr. White took it from his son and placed it upon the table. A holy man wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three men could each have three wishes from it. His manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter jarred somewhat. Why don't you have three, sir? Said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him in the way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. I have, he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the wishes granted? Asked Mrs. White. I did, said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. Has anybody else wished? The first man had his three wishes. Yes. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. He took the paw and dangling it between his front finger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. Oh, White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now, then, Morris," said the old man at last. "Better let it burn. If you don't want it, Morris, give it to me." I won't. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire again, like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. How do you do it? Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud. But I warn you of the consequences. Why we're going to be rich, famous, and happy," said Herbert as the door closed behind their guest. Mr. White eyed the paw dubiously. I don't know what to wish for. I've got all I want. If you cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? Well, wish for two hundred pounds then. That'll just do it. His father, smiling shamefacedly, 
held up the talisman as his son sat down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for two hundred pounds, said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted the words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. Oh, it, it moved as I wished. It twisted in my hands like a snake. They sat down by the fire again while the men finished their pipes. A silence settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. I expect you will find the cash tied up in a bag in the middle of your bed, said Herbert, as he bade them good night and something horrible squatting on top of the wardrobe, watching you pocket your ill-gotten gains. Next morning, the wintry sun streamed over the breakfast table. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room, which it had lacked on the previous night. The dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. The idea of our listening is such nonsense, said Mrs. White. Morris said the things happened so naturally that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence, said Mr. White. Well, don't break into the money before I come back. Herbert rose from the table. His mother, following him to the door, watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity. Herbert will have some more funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home, she said, as they sat at dinner. I dare say, said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. But for all that, the thing moved in my hand. What's the matter? His wife was watching a man outside, peering in an undecided fashion at the house. The well-dressed stranger stood with his hand upon the gate, and then with sudden resolution flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. I come from Moore and Meggins. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? Has anything happened to her, but... Her husband interposed. There, there, mother, don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. I'm sorry. Is he hurt? The visitor bowed in assent badly, but he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, thank God, thank... She broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her. She saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's face. He was caught in the machinery, said the visitor. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White, dazed. The other coughed and walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss. Moore and Megan's admit no liability at all. But in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White, rising to his feet, gazed with horror at his visitor. How much? Two hundred pounds. The old man dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the cemetery, two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence. It was about a week after that the old man woke suddenly in the night. The room was in darkness, and the sound of weeping came from the window. <laughs> Come back, he said tenderly. You will be cold. The old woman wept afresh. Her sobs died away. The bed was warm, his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully, until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw! The monkey's paw! She came stumbling across the room. You've not destroyed it! It's in the parlor on the bracket. Why? The wishes! We've only had one! Go down and get it, and wish our boy alive again! The man sat up in bed. 
He struck a match and lit the candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you are saying. Go and get it and wish. He's been dead ten days. And besides, I would not tell you else. I could only recognize him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then. How now? Bring him back! The old woman dragged him toward the door. He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place. His brow cold with sweat. His wife's face as he entered the room seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish! She cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked wish. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor. He sank, trembling, into a chair as the old woman with burning eyes walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled. The candle end burnt below the rim of the candlestick until with a flicker it expired. The old man crept back to bed, and a minute or two afterward the old woman came silently beside him. Both lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked. The darkness was oppressive. Screwing up his courage, the husband took the box of matches and, striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out. He stood motionless until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room. What's that? cried the old woman, starting up. A rat, said the old man in shaking tones. It's Herbert! She ran to the door, but her husband, catching her by the arm, held her tightly. It's my boy! Let go! I must open the door! For God's sake, don't! The old woman broke free and ran from the room. Her husband called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back. Then the old woman's voice strained and panting. The, the bolt! Come down! I, I can't reach it! But her husband was on his knees, groping on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house. He heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back. At that same moment, he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his last wish. The knocking ceased. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase and a wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. These fireside tales are abridged by Tamsin Collison, with music by Chris O'Shaughnessy and produced by Frank Sterling. They are a unique production for Radio 2. This is Christopher Lee wishing you a very happy new year.